All right, so on to that, we're going to move on to our next, our, our final keynote, uh, Paul Frields. Um, so, longtime member of Fredericksburg Lug. He's been in the Fedora project basically since its foundation, and not too long ago was called in, is now the Fedora project leader. So, we were very grateful when he was willing to come out to our little, little conference and, and discuss a project that involves so many people in this area. I know we have a very large number of Fedora users, even if I'm not normally one of them, but uh, we, we do welcome him anyways. <laughs> but actually, I'm very interested in hearing his take on managing a project as large as Fedora and, and the different things we can learn from. And after that, I, I do hope everyone takes the time to stop by the Fedora booth and learn a little more. And if you haven't for a while, give Fedora Project a try and learn some of the great tools and great things they have done for desktop Linux. So please welcome Paul Frields. got to record me talking to everyone over there. That didn't work too. <laughs> All right, let's see how well this uh, copes here. <laughs> yeah, a little Jesse Jackson repeat. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Apparently, the future includes being tortured by Epson projectors. <laughs> How awful. How awful. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's, let's just go ahead anyway. You'll, uh, you'll be more interested in what I have to say than what you, what you see printed on the screen anyway. I keep it pretty minimal. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is a little bit about the history of the Fedora project, uh, a little about where we are today, uh, what we offer as a project, the, the kind of community that we foster, the things that are important to our project, uh, what's next on the horizon. Um, but something that's important to me is, is why it matters. Uh, and I think that we all just saw an example of that, the kind of community uh, that you can build with open source uh, is the exact same kinds of communities that uh, churches and neighborhoods build all over the country. Um, this is no different. It's people who share some core beliefs, uh, some core values, uh, and a belief in each other and the power of what we can do when we combine energy. So um, who am I? Well, I'm the Fedora Project Leader. Uh, I started six months ago at Red Hat. And uh, for a long time, I was a community member in Fedora, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Uh, my job is a little different than a community manager job. Uh, the job of project leader tends to involve not just community work, but I also work with the engineers inside Red Hat. As you know, we've got hundreds of engineers around the world in different shops. We've got uh, a large portion of them in Westford, Massachusetts. We have a large shop in Brno in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have another uh, fairly large installation in Stuttgart uh, in Germany, and uh, we have uh, several other offices, uh, Mountain View, California, and others. So one of my jobs is to make sure that uh, I am aligning those folks properly with the Fedora project and that we are, uh, you know, we're involving those internal people in the external discussions and at the same time that they're aware of what's going on externally in Fedora. Uh, so that uh, so that we can be prepared for different moves that the community makes, and uh, you know, figure out ways uh, internally to leverage them, uh, also externally to make sure that the uh, that the Fedora community is all working and towards a uh, towards a common goal. Uh, in our case, advancement of free and open source software using only free and open source software. So. Um, in order to talk a little bit about the history of Fedora, I'm going to use a, a picture of the Fedora eons, or as I like to call it, making yourself seem very important by using scientific terms. So um, this is a, a diagram of the, uh, of the, the various eras in, uh, in, in the geologic, uh, in geologic ages. And uh, if you look at humanity, you know we're right at the end of, right at the, end of the spiral, right at the, the top edge here. Um, 
And of course, Linux came around like you know the very pixel at the very end there. <coughs> so, to talk about um, to talk about the community, uh, we need to talk about where how our community formed. How did Fedora's community come about? Uh, it didn't just spring up overnight. It happened as a result of uh, an evolution of processes, an evolution of people, an evolution of attitudes, and an evolution of goals. Uh, the early days, or as the geologists like to call it, the Hidian Eon. Uh, back in the day, uh, Red Hat made a distribution that was sold on the open market. It was a box set you could buy for $40 at Circuit City and Best Buy. And, uh, and uh, you know, I guess the uh, times always come back around because I hear that there are uh, distributions like Ubuntu are, are looking to, uh, to put those sorts of distributions back on shelves again. Um, so in those days, the last of the Red Hat Linux breed, the original, the original Red Hat Linux, was Red Hat Linux 9. And that came out in early 2002. Around that time, there was a project that was started by a uh, CS student at the University of Hawaii. His name's Warren Tagami. And he started a project called Fedora.us. And what they did was to create extra packages to add on to Red Hat Linux 9 to create capabilities that weren't in the boxed product. So it was to bridge the gap between what some customers wanted and what they were getting in the boxed, uh, what they were getting in the boxed product. It's also a way of tying other upstream communities together into Red Hat Linux by packaging their work into RPMs so that you could install them right alongside of all your other software and have it be managed the same way all the other software in the system was. So during this time, you know, Red Hat's attitude was that, gee, you know, this Linux thing is pretty much good for just about anything you want to do. Uh, whether you want to run web servers or create compute clusters, or whether you are just trying to keep track of your checkbook at home, or draw pictures, or edit photos. So along those lines, uh, they undertook to actually sell the distribution uh, through consumer retail outlets. Um, unfortunately, as they found out, that's not a really good money-making model. So uh, it, it does represent some, some, brand, uh, some brand expansion, which is good. But in the long run, uh, the ability to support that model was just simply not there. So Red Hat realized, and you'll see that you know, when I call up these slides, you'll see some red print. And that's Red Hat uh, you know, putting in their little, their little quote during the presentation. They noticed, wow, selling Linux to home users really is hard. So enter the community. Um, Fedora.us represented the proto-community for Fedora. It was people who were interested in extending the reach of their favorite distribution to do something that it wasn't designed to do, which is to capture other upstream software projects and include them, make them just as powerful and just as much a part of the distribution uh, as what Red Hat was taking care of. So the community uh, shows up and tells Red Hat, we'd really like to assist you. We'd like to lend a hand. Well, Red Hat realized uh, at this point that there really was some, there really was some future in this, trying to do a, a real partnership between, uh, between the, the commercial side and the community side. And so this is back, again, around 2002. When Red Hat Linux 9 came out, Red Hat already knew that that was going to be the last of the breed. Uh, or at least the rumblings had occurred. Uh, there had always been talk of, of Red Hat Linux 10 and what that might have been, uh, and there never was one. However, the code name internal to Red Hat at the time was Cambridge. And for those of you who follow the Fedora News, you know that Cambridge was recently just voted the, uh, the code name for our Fedora 10 release. So uh, you could think of, I guess, you know, Fedora Core 1 to Fedora 9 as being like some long dream sequence that happened in the middle with Patrick Duffy in a shower, and I don't. Is anybody old enough to know the Dallas jokes? I don't know. It, it, this this crowd may be a little young for that, but. And then I woke up. It was all just a dream. Annie M, I'm so glad to see you. So anyway, um, so roundabout we come again to Fedora 10 as Cambridge. So um, so back to our back to our community helping with uh, helping with Fedora. Uh, the com this combination was really attractive to Red Hat because it meant that there were people who wanted to do work that Red Hat did not want to undertake itself, and it saw the, the, the possibilities in, in putting this partnership together. And so emerged the Fedora project. This is around 2003, uh, and that's when I got involved with Fedora. Uh, the first I heard of it was when Fedora Core 1 actually was, was published. Uh, after Red Hat Linux 9, I was you know, simply a user of the distribution. I liked it. 
uh, and I never heard any of what happened in between. Um, what happened in between Red Hat Linux 9 and Fedora Core 1 was an example in what not to do to grow your community, and it's a it's a lesson that Red Hat learned very well, and uh, you know they, we definitely we definitely keep it in in mind constantly. Um, what you cannot do is set uh, set expectations for the community that you're actually going to engage them and then fail to follow through. That's usually a good way to destroy your community. So around this time, the Archean Eon of Fedora Core 1 and 2, uh, the community was promised the eventual one true CVS. Now this was, the, this was the repository of source code that we could use to track and create our packages, and we'd do it all together. Hand in hand, we'd walk into the glorious sunset and create a, a distribution to rule them all. Um, unfortunately, the one true CVS required man hours. It required work. It required dedicated work on the part of a few good individuals uh, by the names of uh, Christian Gafton and Michael Johnson. These are some of the people who actually worked on the first CVS. Unfortunately, they had a very big job and at the same time as they were trying to manage a huge amount of technical work on their own, they also had to try and manage the community. It was not working out well. Uh, so the, this, the community started to think of the one true CVS as a mythical creature that You'd never quite meet, but uh, you know, apparently, I guess if you're you're pure enough, it would come lay its head in your lap or something like that. I don't know. We get into a lot of uh, metaphors. I really don't want to discuss here. So, um, unicorns appear and make everything all better magically. That's what happens when the one true CVS comes, and we were promised this for quite a long time. And I say we because I was in the community at the time, very eager to work uh, on a distribution, a real true community distribution in the in the first days of of these. Uh, you know, of, the, of, a, of a commercial enterprise actually getting into that, getting into that line of work. Um, unfortunately, the community ages as you go, and if you leave them waiting long enough, they will simply walk away. Uh, a few stalwarts stuck around. Some people came back to see the dawn of the Protozoic era. This is the time around Fedora Core 3 where we finally had the dawn of something called Fedora Extras. Now, Fedora Extras was a place that the community could create packages in much the same way that Fedora.us did, only we were doing it with infrastructure that was provided by the Fedora project and underwritten by Red Hat. So it was a good way that everyone could work together. Uh, it was, we knew that uh, there, was an invest, there was an investment underlying the hardware, uh, so that hardware was going to be supported, the infrastructure would be supported, and we could simply go to work. Uh, Fedora Core X, I'm sorry, Fedora Extras, was included as, uh, as a repository towards the later end of this time cycle, towards the, uh, towards the five and six period. Uh, you could actually do an installation using core and extras at the same time. So during this time is when the community realized what was actually involved in building the distribution that they loved so much. And uh, essentially what happened is Red Hat turned over a, 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 a pool of building blocks, a pool of Legos here, and said, okay, well, these are very simple. Here's what you get. This is Fedora Extras. You guys can play in this sandbox over here. We'll take care of Fedora Core. Don't worry about that part. And you guys can play over here in Extras. And that way, if something broke, the core distribution was still going to be okay. Right? So again, it's uh, having a, a gate between the community and the commercial side. So just be careful and try not to break anything. Meanwhile, the community went to work with the Legos creating uh, packaging, uh, uh, packaging guidelines and maintenance standards that were so good that they pretty much overrode anything that Red Hat had done in the meantime. And they were so good, in fact, that the engineering managers in Red Hat looked at the community guidelines and said, these are so fantastic that I've got to make a call right now and tell everyone how wonderful they are. Um, they looked at the packaging guidelines and, uh, and said, uh, you know, these are so good, we'd like to adopt them inside. And so we had uh, what was called a merge review. And during that time, almost all the packages that were in Fedora Core were brought up, uh, were brought up for review against the standards the community had developed, uh, weighed and measured, and found wanting. Um, and finally, uh, those, those, uh, those packages were brought into, into adherence to the community's guidelines. So this is an example of how well the community could do something that the company couldn't do on its own. 
So with enough time and enough people working together to create these guidelines, we had something that actually exceeded the engineering standards that Red Hat had developed themselves. So we came back to them and said, hey, look, we made you the guidelines on which you could actually build a distribution with real you know, that had real community effort input and real community impact output. So this brings us to Fedora 7. Now as a result of all this merging of packages and the work that the community had done, uh, around the time of Fedora, uh, Fedora 7, the project leader at that time, Max Spivak, uh, made it his mission in life to eliminate the differences and the divisions between Fedora Core and Fedora Extras. Right? So there would no longer be these two separate sandboxes. There was no longer going to be a division between who can work in uh, uh, who can work on, uh, on, on this kind of core package as opposed to this kind of community add-on. All of the packages became part of one big happy family distribution. Uh, and people are encouraged to, uh, to develop patches and to, uh, to help each other with packaging. We've got, uh, now we have a lot of the original core packages are co-maintained by community developers. Uh, we have, I think it's somewhere around 700 uh, community packagers now, and about 70% of those, 70 or 75% of those, are volunteers. Right? So most of the people doing this work in Fedora are not Red Hat engineers. They're not employed by Red Hat. They're volunteers who simply believe in what they're doing. So that was the dawn of a new uh, eon, this, uh, this combined distribution where everyone could work together as one. So uh, around this time, Red Hat is asking, well, how are we doing? And our response is, well, not too bad, and they're pretty happy about that, but there are still some things that need to change, right? There are, uh, there are, still, uh, there are still areas where we desire improvement from Red Hat. It's a, constant, uh, it's a constant evolution, as I told you before, and that's one of my jobs is to actually watch over uh, the Fedora project as a whole and develop uh, new ways for our community to work with us. So the main way we do that <clears throat> is by encouraging people to become contributors rather than consumers. And this is a, this is a theme you're going to hear over and over if you hear Fedora people uh, talk about our project. Um, Fedora is about advancement of free and open source software by creating a culture of contributors. Right? It's one thing to be a consumer, right? and that's certainly uh, very much encouraged. We love it when people use Fedora. We love it when they use any kind of Linux. Um, there's a lot of technologies that we produce in Fedora that get used in other distributions as well. Uh, a lot of desktop usability uh, pieces that go into every distribution that, uh, that, that's popular nowadays. Uh, and that's wonderful. But what we also want to make sure people know is that the way, the way that this model works, the way that open source succeeds, is not simply by everybody using it and saying, hey, great, we got something fantastic for free. It's also by contributing something back. Right? Mac uh, gave a, a great keynote where he talked about the work that his company did, and when they find something lacking, they fix it. They contribute it back upstream, and it becomes part of the product. And that's what all of us can do, not necessarily by coding. There's a lot of other things that we can do to contribute. And so that's really where I'm going to challenge you guys. Now, you've already had one challenge tonight, and I think that uh, you know, was, a very for, for me, very heart-tugging, being, uh, being a father of two myself, and I hope that everybody will take you know, the challenge of the Serenity Foundation very seriously and, and think, about, uh, think about giving while you're here this weekend. Something else I'd like people to think about uh, in line with free and open source software during this weekend is to think about contributing something. Now, a lot of people here, I know, are, work in various pr upstream projects. But for every one of them, I'm pretty sure that I've met another one of you who's just getting started in open source, and you're here to see what the fuss is about. You may have been using Linux for a year or two, maybe less, maybe more, and you came to find out what is this community thing all about? Who else is using open source? What can I do with it that, I'm not, that I haven't thought of already? One of the things that you can do is to make a difference, right? And this is where my speech sort of turns into the, uh, the the arm-waving, kumbaya-singing, uh, preachy tone for which I'm so widely known in the Fedora Project. I just want everybody to love each other and get along and hug and kiss and all that good stuff. Um, really, the challenge is to think about free and open source software as your way to make a difference in the world, right? Um, there are lots of ways to do that. There are lots of ways to make a difference. You can go work in a soup kitchen. 
right? You can travel to another country and dig a well. Uh, you can create open source software that's going to enable other people in developing countries to help their uh, information economy, to bring their countries uh, into this global, uh, this global system that's, that's been developing over the last 10 or 20 years. So my challenge to, you, to all of you is to think about how you can help with a project that you care about. It could be anything. It doesn't have to even be Fedora. I, I don't care if it's Fedora. Well, I do care if it's Fedora. That's not exactly true. But I would like it if everyone just think about contributing to a project they care about. Now, what are some of the things that you can do, right? Here, this, here's, here's the how-to part. This is how to change the world, right? Starting one step at a time with free and open source software. Here are things that anybody can do. You can be an ambassador. That just means spreading the word about free and open source software, showing people uh, how, they can, uh, how they can escape the trap of security flaws, malware, viruses that plague all of our relatives. I'm sure all of you have your horror stories, as I do. Uh, showing businesses how they can achieve better total co cost of ownership, how they can achieve better revenue per employee, how they, can achieve, how they can achieve better returns on their IT investments using free and open source software. Right? Talking to professors, talking to students, talking to your mom, talking to your grandma about how they can use open source software. Right? All these are ambassadorial duties and you can, you can do them. Right? Here's a group of ambassadors uh, from Germany. Uh, I went to Linux Talk at the end of May, which is uh, a, one of the biggest community open source shows uh, in Europe. And I had the great pleasure of meeting about, and not all of them are pictured here, I met about two dozen uh, Fedora ambassadors. These are people who in their spare time evangelize Linux and free and open source software and Fedora to universities, to businesses, to governments, to spread the knowledge about how open source works. Right? That this isn't just some fairy tale where you get something for free and there's no support behind it. You know, that the support you get from the community really does rival what you can get anywhere else for pay. So these people actually are spreading that message. The booth that you see, all of this, all this great stuff, this was the, the we had a we had a front a, a front row seat in the Linux Talk Expo Hall. When people walked in, the first they saw was this booth. And all these professional people wearing these shirts. I, this, this, is the sh this is one of the shirts I wore to that, to that event. Um, and I, I got it from those guys. And it, this was not created by Red Hat giving these guys a bunch of money and saying, here, you know, buy some t-shirts, buy a really nice booth, et cetera, et cetera. These guys set it up all on their own. Right? They went around to businesses and, and uh, collected, uh, collected subsidies. Right? They talked to the organizers. Uh, they, they got the shirts ordered. They ordered buttons and stickers and all sorts of great stuff. They put, they've put together a foundation, a nonprofit foundation in Germany called Fedora EMEA, uh, or EMEA for Europe, Middle East, Africa. And it's a, it's a, it's a regional nonprofit foundation to channel uh, charitable giving from businesses and individuals into promoting free and open source software through Fedora. So these guys did this work all on their own. Um, this is not a funded effort. These are there's just 20 some of the the nicest, most caring guys I've ever met who just have a belief that that this stuff will change the world. And anybody can do that. Artwork, right? Maybe you're not an artist. Maybe you know somebody who is. Some of the art tools that we have in free and open source software are you know they rival some of the best software that you can buy on the open market uh, for a lot of money. So people can create that art and actually use it to spruce up uh, the desktops that everyone uses every day, the, the icons that you see, uh, the toolbars that we're all looking at, the themes that you use on your desktop. Um, that's a nice way to be able to posit have a positive beautifying effect on hundreds of people or thousands of people in your, just in your local communities. Documentation. Anybody can write, right? Anybody can write a tutorial. You can talk about how you learned to accomplish a new task, the one new command line utility that you found out about today. You just learned how to do some simple awk, right? You learned how to use the TC program to adjust and shape traffic on your, on your Linux system that works as a router. Uh, all of those things can become documentation. You can create documentation by blogging about something that you like. Right, this stuff all enters the, the vast Google mind where people can find it. So anybody can do this stuff. Triage. 
This is something near and dear to my heart because I just started doing it. I had no idea how to triage a bug until about two weeks ago when I finally learned how this works. And it's simply getting bugs from the point where they are new and nobody can tell what the quality is, the developer doesn't even know if they should spend any time on it, getting it from that state to a state where they know someone has looked at it and confirmed that they should be able to, re to either replicate the behavior or fix the bug with a simple patch that's already been, uh, that's already been uh, uh, sent in by a developer. Right? So developers need people to triage bugs for them because they don't have time to look at all of them. There are thousands of upstreams. Every one of those upstreams has tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of bugs filed against it, and a lot of them will never get fixed because the developers simply don't have time to figure out well, whether any of those bugs deserves to be worked on today. So triage actually helps with that. It's very easy to learn. So I would, uh, again, there's another way that you can make an impact on a project that you love. Now, there's a lot of developers in here. I, you know, I see a lot of people couldn't go through dinner without popping open their computer, and I'm one of them, although I don't count myself as a, as a developer, to be certain. But if you're a more adventurous guy, uh, you can work on infrastructure, right? Uh, a lot of projects run their own hardware. Uh, Fedora, we have a, a, a world-class infrastructure that's maintained by a community effort, right? We have a couple Red Hat people who work on it and a large number of community volunteers. And these guys are some of the best sysadmins I've ever seen. I'm gonna can meet one of them here. This young fellow, his name is Ricky Zhao, and he just entered Carnegie Mellon as a freshman, right? And he is one of our best system administrators in Fedora. Uh, he showed up one day about a year, a year plus ago with a desire to work, wanted to learn from some good sysadmins. He had, so, he had plentiful skills on his own, as we found out. And uh, this guy helped turn around a big section of our infrastructure and, uh, and bring, it up to, bring it up to speed so that we're managing, uh, we're managing all of our systems with Puppet, uh, there's a huge amount of technical detail in this that if I, if I range too far into it, I'm going to quickly become embarrassed. So I'll stay away from that part. Um, but Ricky is actually also the recipient of the first ever Fedora scholarship. Right? We set up a scholarship because we realized for, for every guy like Ricky, there are 10 more, there are 10 more young people like him who want to get involved in, Fedora, in free and open source software through Fedora. And they want to do something uh, important that's going to affect the lives of others. And we want to reward that. Uh, by providing them some some help with their their school funding, um, you know Ricky is one of the people who you know, I'm sure people saw some of the trouble that we experienced over the last couple weeks as a result of uh, an intrusion event. And Ricky is one of the people who helped rebuild our infrastructure from the ground up. Basically, within a week, we had reconstructed our entire project from scratch. And the reason it could happen is because of this global infrastructure team of community members. Again, volunteers working hand in hand with Red Hat folks and uh, just doing some amazing work. So Ricky's just an example of, uh, uh, of, of what you can achieve. Website design, if you like that sort of thing. We have, uh, uh, there are plenty of opportunities to spruce up websites. Uh, again, this is, not, this is not something that's relegated just to the Fedora project. Your favorite project probably could use a hand. You, know, you might see your project that's uh, it's aged a little. Maybe they could use uh, you know, some of the latest technologies on their site. You know, it's, it's looking a little long in the tooth. And you want people to know that your favorite project is alive and kicking. It's one of the ways you may be able to do it is simply sprucing up their site a bit. Software packaging. If you have a distribution that you love, they can almost always use software packagers, people to put together the upstream software uh, into consumables that the users can get to very simply. Now, in Fedora, we have a golden rule. And this is one of the things that's, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a differentiator for us. It's something that we believe in very, uh, very sincerely, which is that everything we produce is 100% free and open source software. And that goes for our infrastructure, our build systems, our hosted projects, all the code that we use, our website design, the applications that our, uh, that our engineers write, uh, everything, free and open source software. And what that means is that if Fedora ever f really stumbles and somebody in the community looks at our project and says, you know what, it's not just that I disagree with what you're doing or how you're doing it, I think I could do a better job. They can actually make a copy of everything that we have ever done in Fedora, from soup to nuts, 
start their own project and beat us at our own game. And we firmly believe in that, right? That's what keeps us moving forward is the challenge of making sure that we never make someone feel that that's necessary. And free and open source software is a way to keep everyone honest about that. So what are the kind of things that we're developing for the future? Well, for one thing, we're starting to use asterisk now. We're going to be leveraging that into more communication. As it is right now, if you get a Fedora account, which is very simple, you can go to join.fedoraproject.org, sign up for an account. It takes a couple mouse clicks. That's all, it, that's all it takes. In the old days, there was a there was a very strange dance that you had to do with email and GPG keys, and uh, a lot of that was to satisfy very particular lawyers. And we don't have to listen to those lawyers anymore. So we have a, a plain old click through now for everything. And once you have an account, there's all sorts of uh, there's all sorts of benefits that get you. One of them is you can set up a VoIP account on our asterisk server. Right now, if there's a community member out there in Fedora land who wants to get a hold of me, he can dial the phone on my desk at home. I have a home office. I work out of my house in Virginia. Uh, I live in a town called Fredericksburg. Uh, you know, it, if you you know know anything about the Civil War, you know we have a lot of battle sites around there. It's a really cool place to live. Uh, it's also cool for me because I walk down two flights of stairs to my office every morning. So I still get up at six, fix my coffee, and I'm in my office by seven. Um, if a fedora, yeah, it's oh, it's wonderful too. My wife loves it also because I never stop working. So it means that she doesn't have to look at me in that. You know, honestly, well, I mean, wouldn't you be happy too? I think you would. Um, so the the deal with asterisk is that any contributor in Fedora who's got a, a VoIP account and a phone set up can call me. They can call me at my desk and phone rings on my desk. I pick it up. Hey, who's this? So, uh, you know, we can always chat. That's, I mean, that's a nice thing to have with Asterisk, but the, you can go a lot further with it. So the next, the next uh, wave for us is a series of uh, web applications that are going to allow people to set up uh, ad hoc conference calls, have them recorded, and then the results published on our wiki as, Og, uh, as Ogvorbis files. Right? So that the community, everything stays open and transparent. We don't have meetings going on in secret. The meetings happen openly and transparently, and everybody can hear how, how, the, uh, how, the, uh, how the meeting went. Now, the next question for me is, now how do we make sure that the people in our community who are deaf or hearing impaired can also follow along? So, uh, I'm always accepting ideas. I would love to hear uh, people's ideas on uh, you know, how we could do transcriptions in a, in a community effort. So feel free to email me. You can reach me at, uh, at my email address, which is stickster at gmail.com. So what's one of the other things that we're going to be providing? More mentoring. We're trying to set up a system where people will be keeping office hours, whether it's an IRC or on the phone via asterisk. Uh, what are the, uh, this is actually another good application of asterisk. I mean, I can imagine a future in which uh, every one of our account holders has the ability to uh, act as a support person. Uh, and, and have random routing for support, or who knows, maybe karma-based routing uh, as time goes on, right? Because you don't want to end up with, hi, uh, I need help with my uh, webcam. Uh, I just started using Linux like a month ago. I mean, we, we don't, I think we probably want to avoid that. But there's definitely an application in there, right? There's a future in that. We have right now in our account system, when I, when I started in Fedora, we had a little under uh, 2,000 accounts in the Fedora account system. Um, as of last month, we had 11,200 and some. So changing our system to this nice click-through has uh, uh, definitely increased the visibility. And it's increased the number of people coming in. And now the idea is how do, we, how do we make it sticky for them, right? How do we give them something interesting to contribute to? One of the ways we can do that is by encouraging people to come to events. Right, learning more about the project and what goes on uh, in Fedora. So we have more events happening this year than ever before, including in uh, Europe, Middle East Africa, and the Asia Pacific region. We're going to be having the first ever FUDCon in India uh, in just a, a couple months. So that ought to be a very interesting, uh, interesting event. We have another North American FUDCon coming up at the beginning of December, uh, which we're just now setting up. So if you're interested, I would definitely encourage you to Check our wiki, which you can go to fedoraproject.org slash wiki slash FUDCON, and uh, you can see our schedule there. Easier branding. Branding is important, right? This is something that I, uh, this, this is actually something that um, I wanted to take a, a cue from Ubuntu, because I think they actually did this really well. They have a very liberal uh, community use of their, of their trademarks, right? 
you can alter them a little bit, uh, you know, as long as you're, you're straight up about the fact that, you know, you're a community project. And this is the kind of thing that we really want to encourage in Fedora, too. So we're working on a, a secondary mark that it's going to allow people to create offshoots of Fedora or their own, uh, you know, their own based on Fedora kind of distribution. And they'll be able to advertise that if they want to. You know, if they don't, great. Uh, we already have a few takers on this, some people who want to build appliances based on Fedora, people, we've got the OLPC, one laptop per child. Um, they're interested in doing this as well. So, and better QA, better quality assurance, right? And this is a problem in op free and open source software overall, right? Because software is somewhat like an art. It's never finished, it's only abandoned. Uh, at some point everybody realizes, ah, it's good enough at this point. Um, but what we want to do is we really want to tie up those loose ends. We really want to seal up those, uh, you know, seal up the bow a little nicer. So we're working on ways for the community to participate in testing. We've got uh, some work that's going on with upstreams like Mozilla on new test engines. Uh, we've had to deal with a couple licensing issues because, again, with our, uh, our project's precepts, are that it's important to be 100% free and open source at all times. So we're, we're working with them on that and, and uh, things are progressing nicely. So uh, I expect that we're going to have pretty soon an automated system that's going to allow people to generate test cases for all the different features of the operating system. We can find weaknesses and then have them, uh, have them repaired. We actually elevate those issues to the developers faster. Now, all this is in service of, to me, what's the, the big idea of the Fedora project right now for the next year or two, um, which is not just to be a good community project, not just to use 100% free and open source software, but to build a blueprint for any free and open source project. Anyone who wants to form an open source venture, whether it's a couple guys in the garage who are looking for VC money, or if you're a big company that's looking to open source your project and you want to learn how to build a community around it, this is something that I think Fedora can definitely uh, show the way. I mean, we've spent five years, over five years doing this now. Uh, we've definitely had a bunch of failures. We've learned from those failures and we have, I think, a, a, you know, a, a much higher number of successes uh, based on being attentive to those failures. So I, I look at Fedora as being uh, a way to have a blueprint for, uh, for those sorts of open source concerns. So why do we care? All right, now we're going to even get more hand wavy. And I, I do problem. We're, we're coming into the home stretch here, so stick with me. Um, there's a lot of problems in this world, right? We didn't create all of them. Uh, some of them happened by accident. Some of them happened through uh, people being inattentive. Uh, some of them happened uh, by people being greedy. Um, and some of them happened by simply the dint of having a lot of people on a planet that really wasn't designed for it. So the problems are ecological, they're economical, uh, and they're of epic scale. What is the solution to those problems? The solution is knowledge. Knowledge is the solution to any problem, right? The right knowledge and the right amount of effort applied in service of that knowledge can fix just about anything. Moreover, sharing knowledge means that everybody can participate in solving those problems, right? So you're, the problem that is, uh, that uh, is, is, uh, uh, it's, it's that the problem that is relegated to a, uh, a small farming community in Guatemala can be solved by somebody in Canada. Uh, and again, by distributing that knowledge using open standards, open data exchange protocols, and, o and the fundamental bedrock of open source, right? Not locking people into a way of using that knowledge where that knowledge has to be locked up, has to be paid for. You're not having any gatekeeping on that knowledge. You make it free and open so that everyone can participate in using and growing it. That's the way to solve those problems. Now, for anybody who's left here who's, uh, who's starting around in the community, I, I really, this, is, this is the bedrock principle to me in thinking about open source. And this is how I always ask people to, to explain it to other people. You think about recipes, right? And uh, don't think about the fruitcake that you got for Christmas because you know, those, we all know those are awful. Unless, you know, somebody in your family makes a great fruitcake, in which case, please, please, dear God, send my wife the recipe. Um, we, we use recipes to think about, we use them to learn how to prepare food, right? How to learn how f different tastes go together. We learn what works well, what doesn't work so well, right? Uh, you know, coriander and pudding, not a good mix, just so you know. Um, but we share these recipes to spark ideas, right? So we're not all just making the same thing, although we can certainly do that if we want. We can follow it to the letter. 
But as you learn, you start building on the recipes that you love, right? And this is very much like software. You have an end state that you want to reach. In one case, it's a uh, great gourmet meal. In another case, it's a beautiful interface to your favorite, uh, to your favorite uh, uh, library of, of software. Um, you have instructions that you follow to get there, and you do an assessment at some point. How well am I doing? What do I need to fix? What, what, could I, what, could I, what could I change in this recipe to make it better? What could I change in this software to make users like it more? Right? And there's a bunch of different people uh, involved in the process, and the way that they interact with those recipes or software is different. We've got hobbyists and students who are engaging in a journey of discovery. You've got professionals who do this because they're paid to do it, right? For them, it's work, right? That's why they, that's why they call it work. They pay you to do it. Um, and finally, you've got altruists, and I think we have uh, quite a number of these in open source software, and they do it just for the sheer joy of helping other people. I think recipes are very much the same way. So the table that most people sit at uh, in, the, in the giant restaurant in the sky is, one re is the one restaurant to rule them all, right? The one restaurant that has a, a fixed menu that uh, never changes. You can only order what's on the menu. Don't try and make any special orders from the chef. And by the way, it's pretty pricey. Moreover, they don't tell you what's in it, right? Is this the kind of restaurant that you would like to eat in for the rest of your life? I think most of us would not, right? This is the, this is the power of open source, right? Open source changes all that. It now becomes a billion cooks making a billion wonderful gourmet meals, all of them different, right? A lot of them work together, a recipe from here and a recipe from there become one of the greatest meals you've ever had, okay? This is something that all of us can participate in. Open source has already changed the world, all right? We're not on the way, all right? We're not gonna get there someday. It's already happened, we're there now. Every vertical has changed as a result of open source thinking, right? Businesses don't interact with their customers any different. Even governments are starting to realize that they, they can't maintain the same way of taking, of having their, uh, uh, having their populace take for granted that they have their best interests in mind, right? There's a lot of messaging that goes on now, and it's become a two-way street. Businesses, government, every vertical that's out there from, uh, from health care uh, to, uh, to banking, right? They all deal, deal with their customers differently because of open source. Open source has developed uh, ecologic uh, 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 forward steps. We have greener computers because open source led the way, right? And Linux among them. We led the way by having greater power savings in our kernel has created a, has created a whopping amount of, of, uh, of spare cycles, uh, of, of less electricity use. Um, we've, probably saved the, uh, we've probably saved the world billions of dollars in fossil fuels over the last three or four years as a result of the way our kernel is developed and by dint of the fact that it's used in so many places around the world. And mo moreover, besides fixing it ourselves, we've also forced others to fix their crappy code. Right? So think about that as well. It's not just about what we do, it's about what we force others to do in order to keep up with us. All right? Economy, a way to solve economic problems. Right? We've got a lot of countries in the world that they can't participate in the global information economy. Right? They don't have the infrastructure to do it. They don't have the knowledge to do it. No one goes there, no one teaches them, right? The One Laptop Per Child project, which you'll see prominently featured in the Fedora booth, is a way that Fedora is being used as just an example of more open source software to create a chance for children to get involved in, uh, in their own learning process, to help form their own educational uh, building blocks. And what that does in the long run is it does two things. It keeps them engaged in their educational process and it also ensures that 15, 20 years in the future, those children are gonna be able to bring the knowledge of what they've learned in the information sciences back to the economies of their country, right? And bring them into the global information economy, right? Their countries will actually be able to compete on equal footing with other countries, right? So we're not, hopefully what we're aiming for is to not have a third of the world starving by dint of the fact of where they live, right? Bringing them more knowledge can help with that. And finally, altruism. <clears throat> this is something that's near and dear to my heart because um, I was brought up to believe that volunteering was a good thing. Right? That's, that's the way my parents brought me up and I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room probably, probably shared in that kind of upbringing. Um, in the last 50 years, volunteerism in the United States has dropped 50%, 50% in 50 years. 
Okay, since your parents were born, half the number of soup kitchens have people working in them, right? Half the number of goodwill agencies have people to staff them and have clothes to give out to the needy. Half the amount of money for disaster relief funds, right? When something goes wrong, when somebody's town gets flooded or a hurricane hits, right? Everyone's operating on less, right? And, and every one of us can do something more than we're doing right now. Open source software is a real way to help, right? Because you're giving knowledge solutions to people who can't make them for themselves, who can't afford them. Uh, in some cases, they may not have the infrastructure to support them, but they can be the beneficiaries of the work that you're doing. So again, just to restate my challenge, if you are not already involved in an open source project, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, the best thing you can take away from this weekend is not just how to do something for yourself, but how to do something for others. Right? Free and open source software is a way to do that. I believe that Fedora leads the free and open source software field. and We do it by dint of the fact that we are unafraid to fail and try again repeatedly different things until we succeed. That was always a precept that I learned when I started uh, working with Fedora is to try, fail, repeat as often as necessary and as fast as possible. Right? And that's something that I, I believe that we do. Any one of you can take that message into your own project and apply it, right? Now, how did I get here? Well, 10 years ago, I was a user of Linux, right? It changed my life. I, I actually used it to change the way that I worked for, uh, in, my, uh, in my professional environment. I taught other people to use it, um, but I was a consumer. Five years ago, I joined Fedora and I wrote my first document to teach somebody else how to create a software repository mirror. I thought it was a really interesting thing to do. I had just tried it and nobody had, nobody had ever told me how. I did it and then I said, gee, I had to write this up. Other people could use this too. So I did it. Four years ago, somebody told me how to take that document and put it in a source code management system, in this case, CVS, how far we've come since. Uh, three years ago, I learned how to package that document up and have it included as an RPM that you could install uh, on, your, on your Fedora system. Two years ago, Somebody recognized that I was actually doing work and that I really enjoyed it and that I loved working with com other community members and, and learning how to, ch how, to, uh, how to collaborate with them and said, you know, you'd be a good person to make some decisions in this, uh, in this organization. So uh, we're forming a, government's, a governance committee. We'd like you to get involved. Okay. And I did that for a year. A year and a half ago, I started working with the release team to get our release notes to be, to be part of the spins that we produce uh, every six months. When we turn out Fedora, some of my work goes into that. You'll find my name in the distribution. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not because I'm important. It's exactly the opposite. It's because I'm just another guy who's doing a little bit of work to help, uh, to help make it succeed. And today, when I go to the conferences, people call me fearless leader, which is funny. I just started doing this job six months ago. I, that's when I was hired by Red Hat in February, and I've been doing this since. How did I get there? I was open to ideas, and everybody here is here because you are open to ideas. You're open to figuring out new ways of doing things. You're open to collaboration. You're open to working with other people on a team, right? That's what open source is all about. It's not about who. I, it's not about one person having an idea, cobbling it together, and then springing it on the world. It's by getting other people involved, right? Finding out where the weaknesses are, banging those dents out, and then putting it out and, and doing it repeatedly, banging out another dent, putting it out again, bang out another dent and release it again. Again, release early and often, right? That's a precept of, of open source software. And finally, open to change, realizing that what you create is not perfect and never will be perfect, but you can always improve it if you're open to changing the way that you think, that you're not ever finished, right? You're not ever finished. There's always someone else who can come in and contribute an idea, right? So again, the challenge is for you guys to leave this weekend and take action, right? Don't just use open source, be open source. That is how you change the world. Thanks. Before I, uh, before I get done, I just want to say thank you to the uh, Utah Open Source Foundation for having me, uh, specifically uh, people like Clint Savage and Emily Shaw and uh, Jason Hall uh, for all their work over the past weekend. I know I'm missing a lot of people who are involved in the, in the work here this, uh, this weekend, and so I deeply, deeply appreciate the chance to come and talk to you folks. And also, um, thanks to Knowledge Blue, who's doing the AV support here tonight. 
um, as well as being a, a great sponsor of the event. And also, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to thank them before they left, but the Findlay Quartet entertained us during dinner, so uh, you know, hope we'll send them a nice note afterwards or something saying how great they were. So thanks a lot. Thank you.